So how many of you consider yourselves to be clinical virologist resistance experts? Any arms? Any arms? All of our panel, of course. <laughs> how many of you consider yourself to be HIV clinicians or ID clinicians taking care of patients? Oh, great. All right. Well, I'm going to be looking at the, the side of the coin a little bit differently, from, different from the virus and the resistance side, but more in terms of the patient side, what the patient brings to the equation in terms of managing complexity and that kind of thing. So we're going to go through a case that's uh, just one case. It's going to have lots of parts to it, as most patients do, and uh, ask you some questions as we go along and see how you respond to that. So, our patient's name Amanda. She's a 50-year-old African-American woman, has a long-term HIV history. Um, and we'll get to that in just one second. Here are my disclosures. And let's continue on. So she's been positive for about 10 years. She thinks she was infected by a previous boyfriend. Currently, she's on, uh, hyper, she has hypertension, is on hydrochlorothiazide and lisinopril. She has diabetes and has been controlled with metformin. Her antiretroviral history is such that she was started on a favrin to Novavir FTC back in 2010 when her CD4 cell count was, fell below 350 as it was started back then. She said she had spotty adherence on that regimen because of uh, dizziness and bad dreams which led to viral failure and resistance. So she, has, she has a K103N and M184V known. At that time she was switched to boosted darunavir, rutanavir, and to know for FTC with much better tolerability and, and she's been stably suppressed for about five years now. She denies alcohol, recreational drug use, or tobacco. She's single and sexually active. Worked as an administrative assistant uh, and manager at a university. Family-wise, her father died of an MI at age 48. Her mother has, has, has diabetes and hypertension also. And at this particular meeting with you, her PCP, you recommend that she have a DEXA scan because she stopped menstruating several months ago. So, just to kind of give a flavor of where we're going with this, as many of you have probably followed, the AIDS HIV cohort, which is a cross-sectional analysis of comorbidities among people who are HIV positive versus those who are negative and over 45, has demonstrated that in terms of looking at many different comorbidities, HIV positive people are having these um, more commonly than HIV negative people. I'll use that term first. In terms of hypertension, in terms of myocardial infarctions, peripheral ar arterial disease, and CKD, chronic kidney disease, HIV positive people are coming out more commonly of having these sorts of problems than HIV negative people. Where does this happen? Well, we certainly know that HIV may or may not accelerate aging, and that's a word that we use lightly around here in terms of acceleration. Is it occurring more commonly or is it really occurring faster? Hard to know. Even with ART, Steve Deeks and others have hypothesized that the continued but low-level chronic inflammation continues to drive T-cell maturation, progenitor cell exhaustion, and T-cell dysfunction. So even though we've done a great job at suppressing the patient's virus with these excellent medications that you heard about for the first hour and a half today, there still continues to be problems with uh, chronic inflammation that may in fact be associated with uh, things that will and continue to harm our patients such as comorbidities. So our first question, <clears throat> did Amanda's primary care provider, play, play Like It's You, follow current guidelines for using DEXA scans in screening for fragility fractures in women? Go to the audience response system, please. Great. So, no, he did not. The U.S. Preventive Services Tax Force recommends screening for osteoporosis in women greater than the age of 65, and only in younger women whose fracture risk is greater than that of a 65-year-old white woman with no additional factors for risks. No, he did not, because the American Academy of Family Practice says don't use DEXA screening for osteoporosis in women less than 65 or men less than 70. Um, with no risks, no fracture risk, and it's not cost effective in doing it in younger patients. Yes, he did follow guidelines in that the Osteorenal Exchange Program, OREP, recommends DEXA scans for all HIV positive men and women greater than the, greater than the age of 50, all postmenopausal HIV positive women, HIV positive patients with a history of fragility fracture, those receiving chronic glucocorticoids, uh, and those at high risk of falls. Or maybe the Osteoporosis Foundation says DEXA scanning should be individualized based upon each patient's FRAX score. So pick your answer from those. Yay! Yay! 
Obviously, we've got a smart group, over two thirds have uh, answered correctly. Why weren't these answers correct? I'll just kind of go right to the answer first and say the, the osteorenal exchange program put together by Todd Brown, Jenny Hoy, and others have really looked at an area of, of, of primary care medicine that was really lacking in the fact that most of those other sort of management guidelines really did not look at the risk factor of what, of what HIV infection and antiretroviral treatment bring to the creation of osteoporosis. And so to create a consensus of opinion and guidance for screening and managing well-documented increased risk of fragility fractures um, in that has been seen and documented in persons who are HIV positive and on therapy most of the time, uh, 34 specialists from 16 countries came together and, and started looking at these data more carefully and also incorporated the already existing FRAX tool, which said it was very important to do this at an earlier stage because these are occurring in persons who are younger who are HIV positive. Um, we'll go through that. So the teaching point here really is that bone demineralization disease is more prevalent among persons living with age on ART compared to HIV negative persons in the same age groups. And the contributing causes include not, not only increased bone turnover due to chronic inflammation, as we talked about, associated with HIV, the initiation of antiretroviral therapy, and increased prevalence of standard risk factors such as smoking, hepatitis C, co-infection, substance use among persons living with HIV. This data from Virginia Triant basically demonstrated that comparing HIV positive persons to over 2.2 million HIV negative persons in the Boston area demonstrated that both for men and women, the, the risk of fracture was more prevalent among HIV positives than HIV negatives, the endpoint of osteoporosis. Um, we know that for the, with the, with the, with the uh, start of anti, pretty much any antiretroviral therapy, bone mineral, don't bone, Mineralization decreases both in hip and spine, and these data from the START study, which treated, of course, persons who had high CD4 cell counts, clearly demonstrate that those who got started on treatment earlier in the red lines there uh, had more loss of bone min mineralization than those who got started later, although they both had it over the period of time of this study. And so in order to really um, help people understand how to manage patients because of these different factors, Todd Brown and others came up with this very nice flow chart. I won't go through it in detail, but just let you know that it's available to be able to know how to screen your patients based upon their age, their clinical uh, uh, factors as well, concomitant medications. And basically it says that in terms of follow-up testing, doing the FRAX score, which is a simple online calculation, uh, like others you can look up on the internet, about every two to three years, if the, if it difference, if it actually pushes towards a, recommends a DEXA, then to do that, follow the T-scores in terms of how often you repeat it, either five years or every one to two years. And if bisphosphonates do need to be started to repeat the DEXA scan in two years and reassess the continued need for bisphosphonates. So it's become much easier in terms of the way that goes. Moving on. So on Amanda's physical examination, her vital signs are as, uh, are as shown. She's a febrile, uh, really not hypertensive, but not great for her age. Um, sure, her weight is 185 pounds, and she weighs 84 kilograms. Um, uh, based upon the, her, in, based upon that, her BMI is at 32.8. Generally, she's an obese African-American female, no acute distress, lungs are clear. She does have arcosinillus in her eyes and a two uh, over six carotid brewery with an early two over six uh, systolic murmur and a soft S4 and decreased peripheral pulses. Her abdomen shows excess adipose with a hip to waist ratio of 1.0. It's non-tender, no masses, no hepatospinomegaly. On pelvic exam, she does have a whitish discharge with, consistent with yeast, pink cervix, path was taken, it was normal. Her skin is warm, moist, um, but she has a red-based rash in her intertriginous areas and a dry, flicky uh, exudate on her feet. And her neuro exam is okay, but she has decreased vib vibration in her feet. So on diagnostic studies to go along with this, her uh, CBC shows a hemoglobin a bit decrease at 2.5, a white cell count and platelets normal. Her CMP shows a glucose, which is uh, not fasting at 215. BUN and creatinine are, are shown there. Creatinine is a bit elevated and calculates to a creatinine clearance of about 62 mils per minute. Her ALT is a bit elevated at 65. Her AST is normal, as is her uh, GGT, and her hemoglobin A1C is 7.4. Total cholesterol is 230, LDL is 145, HDL is 38, and her triglycerides are 305. 
Her viral load is beautifully undetectable at less than 20. CD4 cell counts are 550. And her DEXA scan, which she didn't in fact get, shows osteopenia in the lumbar spine and osteoporosis in both femoral hip, hip zones. So first audience response question. We're going to just ignore that just for a second and move on to something else. We'll come back to it. All the following are risk factors for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, in a man is history, physical exam in laboratory, except, which is not a risk factor for NAFLD. Type 2 diabetes, HIV infection, elevated ALT, but normal AST, and bed elevated at GGT, or long-term use of tenofovir, which has been on for over 10 years. Pick your answer now. Wow. Great. Well, you sure? You sure? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. The early voters, well, there we go. Coming back. So just to say that, again, um, you guys are, are hard, to, hard to fool. Uh, the long-term use of tenofovir is, in fact, the risk factor that is, most, that is least likely to be a problem here. Uh, even though older um, uh, medications in the nucleoside class, such as AZT, D4T, DDI, et cetera, were problematic in terms of being associated with liver disease, uh, tenofovir has not been shown to be. All other risk factors on there certainly are. Exactly. All right. So the teaching point is that recent data on the epidemiology of NAFLD is increasingly identifying this as the, as the new most common cause of liver disease in persons living with HIV, outstripping hepatitis C infection in some situations. While pathogenesis is not entirely clear, HIV infection has been identified as one of the strongest associated risk factors. Let's look at that just a bit. So some of the data from this, uh, from the International AIDS Society, uh, International um, AIDS Society Conference last summer in, in um, the Netherlands, a very interesting longitudinal uh, cohort uh, study from Brazil called the Brazilian Longitudinal Health of Adult, uh, Study of Adult Health, was looking at the incidence of steatosis, liver, fatty liver disease, among um, persons and looking for risk factors that might be, you might be associated with. Increased age, increased BMI, increased waist circumference, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, metabolic syndrome, hypertension were all part of that as well. In terms of looking at the 500 and um, uh, 650 HIV positive patients in there, lower, a higher CD4 cell count was actually associated with steatosis, maybe a sign of a treatment, and the duration of antiretroviral therapy was one as well. Looking specifically at the risk factors among those 650 HIV positive individuals, male sex um, was associated, black or mixed pardo race was not, it was a decrease sign, increased BMM, uh, di type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension. Poor clinical management was a, a, not a decrease um, a reason for it. The CD4 cell count and viral load were low levels as well. But I think the important thing here is that this analysis showed that HIV infection carried over a two-fold increased risk of having liver disease, which is something I think it's <clears throat> important to look at in terms of what's causing this problem in our patients, um, which is, of course, not unique to HIV-positive people, but is happening in HIV-negative people as well as the U.S and other parts of the world start getting fatter and fatter from other reasons that liver disease is occurring. So some of the risk factors we certainly do know well about are obesity, central adiposity, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, the race, ethnicity, hereditary, sex, and age are not quite as clear in all situations, but certainly those first four are. How, pre how prevalent is, is uh, fatty liver disease among HIV positive people? From a long list here you can see of different studies that have been looking at this over the past 10, uh, 10 to 12 years. We can, and looking at this from different parts of the world uh, and using different sort of um, assessment tools from ultrasound, CT, uh, MR, and even liver biopsy, it ranges from as low as 13%. Um, to as high as over 50% in terms of the occurring in HIV positive individuals. So that, this is something that we need to be aware about. Next slide. Oh, I got that. So management, treatment, and issues. So managed informed of her uh, results of her DEXA scan and her elevated risk 
of having a hip fragility fracture due to the current osteoporosis. She asked if what can be done about this to try to heal her bones and prevent her from having a fracture. In regard to her risk for developing liver disease, she states that she already does not drink uh, alcohol or take recreational drugs and wants to know what she can do to improve her liver health as well, of course. So, in addition to starting alendronate, <clears throat> calcium carbonate, and vitamin D for about one year, how would you alter her current ART regimen, which is Durinder, boosted Durinderveer to Novavir FTC, to decrease her chances of having the fragility fracture of her hip? Would you switch the current regimen um, to simply a, a single tablet regimen of Durinderveer cobicistat? Uh, TAF and FTC, switch it to Dolutegravir Abacavir 3TC, switch it to Dolutegravir Rilpivirine, or switch it to Bictegravir, TAF, and FTC. Of course, any of those regimens containing the integrase would have to be separated by at least two hours from the calcium supplement she's taking. Please vote. Gotcha. Gotcha. I put the, um, the, the big take of your TAF FTC in there primarily because of the fact that it was a single tablet regimen, but of course, a, a, another regimen that could have been used, I think, probably just as well, would have been the uh, TAF FTC plus uh, Doi Tegavir 2 tablet regimen as well. But trying to stick with single tablet regimens is what we were trying to do in terms of keeping her life simple. So um, it looked like over half of people are, are, are choosing the single tablet regimen of Bictegravir TAF FTC over others. Let's kind of look at why we would want to do that. Certainly, we could continue her on um, the Darunavir regimen and switch her simply from Tenofovir to TAF FTC, and we would actually get good continued virologic suppression, which would be one way to look at this in terms of keeping her virus suppressed, as the AMBER study told us can happen in terms of putting the pill and medication all into one pill, but we will really not improve other parts of her other risk factors. You know, she does have some, some renal disease here already with a creatinine clearance of right around 60. Um, and although in the, her lumbar spine uh, and, and uh, DEXA is already showing osteopenia, the difference here in terms of changes with this boosted PI did not really make a big difference in terms of those, so probably would not want to go that way. How about switching her over to uh, Dolutegravir, Abacavir 3TC? Certainly, from the striving study, we know that switching patients onto the single tablet regimen who have been on other medications, and however, this study was done in persons who were undetectable at the time and never had failure, and she has had failure, uh, would be problematic primarily because of the fact that the Abacavir may, in fact, be problematic down the road because she would be considered to be high risk for cardiovascular disease in terms of the other risk factors we've already known that she has. And the third thing about switching her to doitegravir pivorine, well, that could probably work really well because she does not have mutations that would probably be a problem with this. We have good data from the SWORD study showing that when patients are switched off of a medication regimen of many different sort of types, that continued suppression has continued out over two years, um, and that actually works very nicely. But the problem here is that she does have a K103N and an M184V, and that's a problem in terms of not being able to use this kind of regimen in a patient that's already had underlying resistance, so we couldn't count on those kind of great results. And then finally, in terms of the big Tegravir, Tenofovir FTC, or I would say Dolly Tegravir plus two tablets of Tenofovir uh, TAF plus FTC, we have good data certainly from the um, uh, GS1961 study, which switched women specifically, like her, off a regimen they were tolerating pretty well over to, B to BF TAF or kept their own on their, uh, 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 their previous regimen. And basically, viral load suppression was maintained. So again, the most important thing in a switch anytime is to keep the virus su suppressed, especially when the patient's starting off that way. Uh, in this case, we can be confirmed, assured that that would happen. Um, and then we may get her lipids to actually go up a little bit because of the lack of tenofovir, but her adrenal function and her bone mineralization would probably be okay in terms of these situations of switching over to a TAF regimen like this. But data looking, let's get back to her osteoporosis. Data looking at comparison of managing osteoporosis and switching tenofovir to TAF versus continuing tenofovir and using the bisphosphonate favors actually the use of bisphosphonate with tenofovir. A study done 
uh, here uh, by Andrew Carr and others actually did this in using zolindronic acid and adding that to patients who had osteoporosis and keeping, keeping them on the tenofovir versus switching them to TAF. And in fact, what was demonstrated was that switching to TAF was not the best thing if you actually were going to add the zolindronic acid. However, Further research has actually done that in terms of using uh, Sinofovir to TAF and using the bisphosphonate and actually demonstrated that those two changes actually do improve bone mineralization over a period of time as well. So perhaps doing both would actually be the best way to go, as she's doing now. So evolution, her antiretroviral regimen has changed to BF-TAF along with starting a linderinate calcium carbonate, vitamin D for one year. She tolerates this great. She adheres to her diabetic diet and begins to, some light weight-bearing exercises. Her rash and vaginal discharge resolve. Her blood pressure goes down. Her weight goes down. Her BMI is down, down to 31. Um, her glucose control is a little better at 165. Her creatinine clearance is about the same, hasn't really changed. Her hemoglobin A1C has come down from 7.6 to 7.0. Her ALT has gone up a little bit. AST is about the same. G G EGT has gone up a little bit. Her lipids are a little bit more well controlled. She's still undetectable. Viral load looks great. And an ultrasound of her abdomen reveals increased hepatic steatosis, or NASH, and she opts out of a liver biopsy due to its invasive nature. She doesn't want to get biopsy to actually make the diagnosis definitive. So which of the following interventions is not recommended to improve NAFL or NASH in persons living with HIV? Weight reduction of at least 10% with diet and exercise. Lipid lowering agents such as azetabine and statins. Or bariatric surgery to help lose more weight. Or vitamin E with or without pediclitazone. Which one of those um, has uh, not been recommended to actually deal with NASH? Great. You might be surprised. So finally, everyone didn't get the answer right. In fact, much of you got it wrong. So um, the reason is, is that lipid lowering agents, has, has, these have been shown not to be helpful in terms of dealing with NASH, whereas everything else on this list has in fact been shown to be beneficial. And although they're not considered to be uh, definitively the, the only way to go, they are on the list of things to do in terms of helping patients that have had NASH diagnosed. Weight reduction of at least 10%. Lipid lowering agents are not part of this, and they actually may cause increased hepatotoxicity. Bariatric surgery has been um, recommended as part of this based upon the fact that it, losing weight is a very important um, management tool in terms of helping patients be able to deal better with the liver disease. And finally, the use of vitamin E with or without pioglitazone has been a bit controversial, but has had some, shown some benefit in terms of using these two, actually more so with the vitamin E than with the pioglitazone, in fact. So in case summary, this case illustrates several of the post um, combination ART era comorbidities that patients who are aging with HIV and on, on retroviral therapy are now facing. Two possible causes, of course, are persistent low level HIV related immune activation despite suppressive ART. Consequences of ART itself, such as decreased bone demineralization, prolonged uh, TDF, hyperlipidemia, boost from boosted PIs. The adjustments to Amanda's ART were needed to maintain her viral suppression while decreasing the adverse events of the ARVs themselves. NAVL is estimated to be present in up to 40% of persons living with HIV infection now, replacing hepatitis C as the most common cause of liver disease in persons who are HIV positive. And obesity-related diabetes, hyperlipidemia, chronic inflammation have all negative metabolic effects on the liver, which if left unrecognized and untreated can lead to cirrhosis and liver-related death, so the silent sort of liver disease. ART continues to produce new, highly potent, well-tolerated, and simple regimens with less toxicity and strategies to mitigate uh, low-level inflammation, obesity, and other post-ART comorbidities are still urgently needed. Thank you very much. I'll answer any questions.